Hello and welcome. I am Daisy, your hostess. I preface the introduction of this video by saying I'm not a theologist and in some way that gives me the liberty and freedom to use my spiritual sense without the lens of an academia. And I approach this topic with curiosity and the awareness that politics and religion have played a major role in the progress of who we have become as people. I have added links to my research in the description of this video. In fact, I learned that the separation of church and state is considered relatively a new development. When Emperor Constantine gave freedom of religion to the Roman Empire in the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, he gave many government buildings over to the church for its use and Christianity became the state religion of the empire. It was hard to distinguish the role of government from that of the church. And prior to that, religion, politics, and medicine all took place under the same roof, known back then as temples. People went to the temple for healing. They went to the temple for sales. They went to the temple for religion and for study and philosophy. Keep in mind, Christianity began in the first century CE, after the death of Jesus of Nazareth. Christianity, as it is known today, did not appear suddenly or was fully formed. Christianity grew out of Jewish traditions and was shaped by Greek, Roman, cultural, and political structures for several centuries. And one would have to dive into the cultural past to see the evolution of Christianity into what it is today. It may disrupt your knowledge base, but if you are strong in your faith, you will appreciate it much more. So if you want to see the nexus and birth of Christianity, I would encourage you to visit Dr. Hillman's channel called Lady Babylon here on YouTube. I caution you in advance. He reads and quotes from original sources of that era, the classical Greek and some Latin. Very little of what he says is his opinion. Now, coming back to where we are, this video is yet another version of creation story titled The Secret Book of John, originally written in Greek by an unknown author. I'm taking the liberty of commenting some of my observations, so feel free to visit the description of this video and use the jump link to get into the reading of the book, if that is what you choose. Otherwise, sit back as I share some of my observations. The Apocryphon of John is a Gnostic Christian text that is considered pseudepigraphical, meaning it is attributed to John the Apostle, but was not written by him. It is believed to have been written around 180 CE. Apocryphon is just a fancy word for secret book. It was written during a time when books such as these were ordered to be hidden or burned. Now, the evidence for the time period is attributed around 180 CE when Irenaeus, a bishop of Lyon, decided to write a book titled Adversus Heresis, attacking all forms of Christianity that differed from the form of which he approved. He outlined some sections of the secret book of John in detail. This tells us that the secret book of John must have been written well before 180 CE, although not in the exact form that we have it now. And that is a topic in and of itself, which I will touch upon in a minute. The issue of Bishop Arenas having read it gives us also a clue that it was in circulation in Gaul, which is today's France. Fast forward to Cairo in 1896, German scholar Karl Reinhardt bought an ancient book written in Coptic, the ancient Egyptian language written in mainly Greek letters. That book, which is now known as the Berlin Gnostic Codex, turned out to contain three important Gnostic writings, the Gospel of Mary, the Secret Book of John, and the Wisdom of Jesus Christ. Because of the two world wars, these texts were not available until the late 1950s. That's over, what, 50 years or so, which sometimes makes me think of conspiracy theories from the point that on the average, a generation is generally considered to be a period of, what, 20, 30 years, which is the average time it takes for children to be born, to grow up, and to have children of their own. So that would have been, like what, almost two generations before it was made available to the general public? That is, if anyone was paying attention. 
which sometimes makes me wonder if wars not only have to do with power, territory, and resources, perhaps maybe with suppression of knowledge. And who knows what other discoveries are waiting to see the light of our times and how each of those new discovery will distort our history books. Well, let me reel this back a bit. In Nag Hammadi, Egypt in 1945, local workers stumbled upon a large jar in which were hidden 13 books containing a total of 52 documents of ancient Gnostic wisdom. The document that appears most frequently in Nag Hammadi collection is the Secret Book of John. Three copies were found there, so it appears that there are four copies of the Secret Book of John, three from Nag Hammadi, Egypt, and the fourth in the Berlin Gnostic Codex from an unknown place in Egypt. All are written in Coptic, but like the other Nag Hammadi documents, they were originally written in Greek. So at this point, I'd like to mention that there are two thoughts in regards to Gnosticism origins. Some say it originated outside of Christianity, and others say it's from within Christianity. And I mention this because we're already using and throwing out the word Gnostic. So for purposes of this video, suffice to say that the Gnostic doctrine taught that the world was created and ruled by a lesser divinity, the Demiurge, and that Christ was an emissary of the remote supreme divine being, the esoteric knowledge, Gnosis, of whom enabled the redemption of the human spirit. So the secret book of John describes a revelation of the ascended Jesus Christ to his disciple John, son of Zebedee. The disciple John is then questioned by a Pharisee who doubts the validity of Jesus' teaching. And John is distraught and goes off to pray. We get introduced to the writing. The words begin to flow and we are provided with a gradual emergence of God's mind. Though the unknown author attempts to describe God as undescribable and ultimately attempts to succeed by using a counterplay of words, which makes it hard to describe, of course. From the Gnostic point of view, it is the story of where we originated, how we came into this world, what our condition is now, and how we can escape it. It is important to point out that even this version is enhanced from its original state and the translator Stephen Davis alerts us of these facts and lets us know that all the text that is in black font is the original text, which I make a point to let you know when I'm transitioning into a different colored font. I take pause for a moment and recognize that Jesus, according to what I've read, never wrote anything himself and offered his wisdom orally. It is written that the first biblical stories were passed down orally and only written down later by various authors. And hence, that's why when you look at a Bible, it's got so many uh, different books with different authors. Now, the Septuagint, which is a good time to bring this up, is a Greek version of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, including the Apocrypha. And it was said to be written by Greek-speaking Jews in Egypt at the request of King Ptolemy of Egypt, who gave a royal welcome to the 70 sages from the land of Israel, whom he had invited to Alexandria to translate the Law of Moses into the Greek language. Hence the root word sept in Septuagint. This was around the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC. Additionally, the Septuagint was also adopted by the early Christian churches. So, if anyone is interested in reading from the original source, the first Bible ever, they may first need to take up Mother Greek and read the original written by Greek-speaking Jews, offering the first written translation of Jewish laws, creating the first Bible, also known as Old Testament, the Septuagint. Who knows how far we have wandered away from those original texts and what has been obfuscated in its translation. Prior to the Septuagint, those biblical stories for some time went through a period of oral transmission, either wholly or as several different stories before it was transcribed and over time redacted. It is said that there are over 450 known versions of the Bible in English alone and thousands more spanning various languages and dialects. If anything, it seems that when we travel back in time, and read ancient texts, whether it be sacred texts, history, 
poetry, or songs. We travel back in time to a different world and a different culture void of today's technology, today's science and concepts. And what I've learned is that for as long as we've been here on Earth, it appears that man has been curious as how he got here. Drawing our attention back to the secret book of John, it is said to be the most important and valued book of the Gnostic religion. Let's keep in mind the esoteric nature of the content and its original language being Greek, there is much to say about its initial foundation, given the mythology of the Greeks and their mastery of language back then and the surrounding cultural influences. In this creation story, we will be told of the emanation of source, the structure of the celestial court, which begins to give us a glimpse of the social model of religion and perhaps government as well as a mental model of the divine structure. And believe it or not, somewhere in there, there's actually a deluge story as well. And as we're introduced to these images, the author is revealing aspects of the divine mind. Yet, from the perspective of the secret book of John, when the topic of angels and demons come up, one can't help but notice their connection with man. The demons appear to impose their passions and undesirable feelings and motivations into man as part of their ongoing effort to render man ignorant, forgetful, and entrapped within his own body, man's body. And we'll see some of that in the creation of Adam and Eve and how the Gnostic view appears to remain as a consistent psychological narrative with the fall of man into the material world, trapping him into believing in the existence of an external material world. And when man accepts the spiritual aspect of his being according to the secret book of John, this world of matter is real only in so far as it is thought to be real. Considering the material world was thought into being initially by Yaldabaoth and subsequently by human beings. So now we have constructed a collective paradigm of the material world together. There is a section in the secret book of John during the creation of man where the author describes a sequence of bodily parts, emotional functions, and so forth being created by demons. This brings in a concept espoused by the religion of Zoroaster, which is said to be one of the world's oldest known living religions and has its origin going back to prehistoric Central Asia of the second millennium when the Iranian people, also called Indo-Iranians, separated from their relatives, the Indo-Aryan tribesmen, and they began inhabiting those areas up there, the Iranian plateau. They believe that the world and everything that embraces our entire existence has been created by the good and evil spirits of equal divine might. So in Zoroastrian liturgy, they are mentioned as being twins. So to me, this section appears to be a different version of creation as depicted by the Orthodox Christianity and Judaism, which pretty much in Genesis, to paraphrase, has God creating humanity in God's image, where it states that the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, without going into another rabbit hole, is that image a physical image? or a spiritual aspect, because I can't say that spiritual has an image, right? Yet, the more material anything is, from the point of view of the secret book of John, the more imprisoning and farther from God it is. Now, there is this odd story involving wisdom, also known as Sophia, which is the last being to emerge after Christ, and gets the idea that she wants to give birth to a new being of her own, but does so without the involvement or permission of her partner or God, and doing so spawns out the monstrous demiurge Yaldabaoth. Now this made me think about how many times we as individuals really think we are doing things by ourselves and fail to see how integral we are in the lives of each other. We struggle for individuality, yet in each other, we have a partnership. A chef could be sad if he didn't have anyone to eat his food. A builder of a house would not be fulfilled if families were not living in his houses. And an artist, I'm sure, wishes someone would admire and enjoy their work. So we too, oddly, 
have partnerships with each other. And looking at the state of affairs in our world today, one could almost sense that humankind appears to be struggling with two competing forces or natures of good and evil, doing everything to prevent humankind from attaining Gnosis. So maybe we can learn something from John. We don't have to espouse all these beliefs, but there's always a lesson, there's always a golden nugget, I believe. And probably it's to seek the silence, and in the silence we'll find our answers. Because it was in prayer that John received his answer, and all this was revealed, and he was provided also with a way out of the struggle. So with this, I turn the page. The Secret Book of John also known as the Apocryphon of John, translated by Stephen Davis. Notes by the translator. It has always seemed to me that the secret book of John evolved to be more difficult to read than it originally was. The secret book of John is a complex development mythology that has been made more complicated because, over the years, Versions of it have been, quote-unquote, improved by several levels of scribal alteration. One set of levels is the evident addition of rather lengthy texts, a list of magical names, a dialogue on the soul, a providence hymn, to an original version that lacked them. Another set of levels is the addition by various scribes of what they intended to be useful comments, explanations, clarifications, and supplementary details. The former processes continue to be added to the text when scholars, such as myself, add introductory paragraphs, or indeed whole book-length texts to introduce or comment on the secret book of John. The latter process continue when scholars interrupt the flow of the text by adding subheadings such as the section headings added here in bold italics, and notes intended to assist the reader's understanding, constituting the text as separable units, and so be relieved from thinking that somehow all of this material constitutes one originally coherent whole. To this end, in this version of my translation, I use two formatting techniques to identify and separate out several forms of material that seem to have been added at different times to the original. For more extensive textual additions, I have arranged that the translation make use of different color fonts. There is one font color for the main body of the secret book of John, font color one, black. Another for the material I believe to have been added by a Christian editor who sought to present the text as a long dialogue between Jesus and John, son of Zebedee, font color 2, blue. This material occurs in two large blocks at the beginning and toward the end of the text, and also in occasional dialogues embedded throughout the last half of the text. Another font, font color 3, green, distinguishes a long list of demon names that are associated with specific body parts, a magical text apparently taken from an unknown source called the Book of Zoroaster. Another font color, 4, red, is used for the included dialogue about the soul. And finally, a font, font color 5, fuchsia or purple, designates the three-part hymn spoken by God's providence, pronoia. In addition to these different fonts, I have put in square brackets the occasional short passages or sentences or phrases that I believe were added to the text by scribes over the years. Additions that were intended to make the text more understandable or to identify elements of the text with aspects of Christian religion. If you ask how I know which parts were added as comments and so forth, The answer is that I make informed guesses. That's really what most scholarship comes down to, informed guesses.
the teaching of the Savior, the revelation of the mysteries hidden in silence. Those things that he taught to John, his disciple. Prologue Font in Blue One day, John the brother of James, these are the sons of Zebedee, was going up to the temple. A Pharisee by the name of Arimanios came up to him and challenged him, asking, Where is the teacher you used to follow? John replied, He has gone back to the place from which he came. The Pharisee said, That Nazarene misled you, plural, told you lies, closed your hearts, and turned you away from your ancestral traditions. When I heard these things, I, John, turned away from the temple and went off to a deserted, mountainous place. I was very unhappy, saying to myself, How was the Savior designated? Why did his father send him into the world? Who is his father? What kind of realm will we go to? For although he told us this realm is modeled on the imperishable realm, he didn't teach us about the latter. All of a sudden, while I was contemplating these things, behold, the heavens opened and the whole of creation shone with a light from above and the world quaked. I was afraid, yet behold, a little child appeared before me in the light. I continued looking at him as he became an old man, and then he changed again, becoming like a young man. I didn't understand what I was seeing, but the one likeness had several forms in the light, and these likenesses appeared each through the other, and the vision had three forms. He said to me, John, why doubt? Why be afraid? Don't you know this image? Be not afraid, I am with you, plural, always. I am the Father, the Mother, the Son. I am the incorruptible purity. I have come to teach you about what is, and what was, and what will be, in order for you to understand the invisible world, and the world that is visible, and the immovable race of perfect humanity. Raise your head. Understand my lessons. Share them with any others who have received the Spirit, who are from the immovable race of perfect humanity. And a blue font. Black font. The inexpressible one. The one rules all. Nothing has authority over it. It is the God. It is Father of everything, Holy One, the Invisible One over everything. It is uncontaminated, pure light no eye can bear to look within. The One is the Invisible Spirit. It is not right to think of it as a God or as like God. It is more than just God. Nothing is above it. Nothing rules it. Since everything exists within it, it does not exist within anything. Since it is not dependent on anything, it is eternal. It is absolutely complete and so needs nothing. It is utterly perfect light. The one is without boundaries. Nothing exists outside of it to border it. The one cannot be investigated. Nothing exists apart from it to investigate it. The one cannot be measured. Nothing exists external to it to measure it. The one cannot be seen, for no one can envision it. The one is eternal, for it exists forever. The one is inconceivable, for no one can comprehend it. The one is indescribable, for no one can put any words to it. The one is infinite light, purity, holiness, stainless. The one is incomprehensible, perfectly free from corruption. Not perfect, not blessed, not divine, but superior to such concepts, 
neither physical nor unphysical, neither immense nor infinitesimal. It is impossible to specify in quantity or quality, for it is beyond knowledge. The one is not a being among other beings. It is vastly superior, but it is not superior. It is outside of realms of being and time, for whatever is within realms of being was created, and whatever is within time had time allotted to it. The one receives nothing from anything. It simply apprehends itself in its own perfect light. The one is majestic. The one is measurelessly majesty, chief of all realms, producing all realms. Light producing light. Life producing life. Blessedness producing blessedness. Knowledge producing knowledge. Good producing goodness. Mercy producing mercy. Generous producing generosity. It does not possess these things. It gives forth light beyond measure, beyond comprehension. What can I say? His realm is eternal, peaceful, silent, resting before everything. He is the head of every realm, sustaining each of them through goodness. The Origin of Reality We would know nothing of the ineffable and nothing of the immeasurable without the help of the One who comes forth from the One who is the Father. He alone has informed us. The Father is surrounded by light. He apprehends himself in that light, which is the pure spring of the water of life that sustains all realms. He is conscious of his image everywhere around him. Perceiving his image in this spring of spirit pouring forth from himself, he is enamored of the image he sees in the light water, the spring of pure light water enveloping him. His self-aware thought, Enoya, came into being, appearing to him in the effulgence of his light. She stood before him. This then is the first of the powers prior to everything, arising out of the mind of the Father, the providence, pronoia, of everything. Her light reflects his light. She is from his image in his light, perfect in power. Image of the invisible perfect virgin spirit. She is the initial power, glory of Barbello, glorious among the realms, glory of revelation. She gave glory to the virgin spirit. She praised him, for she arose from him. This, the first thought, is the spirit's image. She is the universal womb. She is before everything. She is mother, father, first man, holy spirit, thrice male, thrice powerful, thrice named, androgynous eternal realm, first to raise among the invisible realms. She, Barbello, asked the virgin spirit for foreknowledge, prognosis. The spirit agreed. Foreknowledge came forth and stood by providence. This one came through the invisible virgin, spirit's thought. Foreknowledge gave glory to the spirit and to Barbello, the spirit's perfect power, for she was the reason that it had come into being. Primary Structures of the Divine Mind She, Barbello, asked the virgin spirit for incorruptibility. The spirit agreed. Incorruptibility came forth and stood by thought and foreknowledge. Incorruptibility gave glory to the invisible virgin spirit and to Barbello, for she was the reason that it had come into being. She asked for everlasting life. The spirit agreed. Everlasting life came forth, and they all stood together. They gave glory to the invisible spirit and to Barbello, 
for she was the reason that it had come into being. She asked for truth. The spirit agreed. Truth came forth, and they all stood together. They gave glory to the invisible spirit and to Barbello, for she was the reason that it had come into being. This is the fivefold realm of the Father. The first man who is the image of the invisible spirit, who is providence, who is Barbello, who is thought. And foreknowledge, incorruptibility, life, everlasting truth. These are androgynous fivefold realm, therefore it is a realm of ten of the Father. Secondary Structures of the Divine Mind The Father looked into Barbello, into the pure light surrounding the invisible spirit. Barbello conceived and bore a spark of light, who had blessedness similar to, but not equal to, her blessedness, who was the only child of that mother, father, the only offspring, the only begotten child of the pure light, the father. The invisible virgin spirit celebrated the light that had been produced, coming forth from the first power, who is the providence Barbello. The spirit appointed him with goodness, making him perfect. He lacked no goodness whatsoever, for he was anointed with the invisible spirit's goodness. He stood in the spirit's presence, and it was poured upon him. Having received this anointing from the Spirit, he immediately glorified Him, and he glorified the perfect providence. Because of her, he had come into being. He asked for mind, nous, to be a companion to Him. The Spirit consented. When the invisible Spirit consented, mind came into being. It stood by the anointed and glorified the Spirit and Barbello. These beings came into existence through silence and thought. He wished to act through the word of the invisible spirit, whose will became an action and appeared with mind, glorifying the light, and then word followed will into being. The Christ, the divine autogenes, created everything through the word. Everlasting life and will mind and foreknowledge stood together. They glorified the invisible spirit and Barbello. Because of her, they had come into being. Tertiary Structures of the Divine Mind The Holy Spirit brought his and Barbello's divine autogenes son to completion in order that he could stand before the great invisible virgin spirit as the divine autogenes Christ and honor him with a mighty voice. The Son came through providence. The invisible spirit placed the divine autogenes over everything. All authorities were subordinated to him. The truth within him let him learn everything. He is called by the highest name of all. The name will be told only to those who are worthy to hear it from the light which is the Christ. From the incorruptibility, through a gift of the Spirit, the four lights arising from the divine origins stood before him. The four fundamental powers are understanding, grace, perception, and consideration. Grace exists within the realm of the light called Harmazel, the first angel along with Harmazel, are grace, truth, form. The second light is called Oriel, and it stands over the second realm. With Oriel are conceptualization, epinoia, perception, memory. The third light is called Devethai, and it stands over the third realm. With Devethai are understanding, love, idea. The fourth light is called Elalith, and it stands over the fourth realm. With Elalith are perfection, peace, wisdom, Sophia. 
These are the four lights standing before the divine autogenes. Twelve realms stand before the Son of the Powerful, the autogenes, the Christ, through the intention and the grace of the invisible spirit. Twelve realms belong to the Son of the autogenes. All of this came into being through the intention of the Holy Spirit, through the autogenes. From the perfect mind's foreknowledge, through the intention of the invisible spirit and the autogenes will. The perfect human appeared, its first true manifestation. The virgin spirit named the human Adamas and placed him over the first realm with the mighty autogenes Christ, with the first light Harmazel in its powers. The invisible one gave Adamas invisible power of mind. Adama spoke, glorifying and praising the invisible spirit. Everything has come into being from you. Everything will return to you. I will praise you and glorify you and the autogenes and the triple realm, Father, Mother, Son, the perfect power. Over the second realm was appointed Adama's son, Seth, with the second light, Oriel. In the third realm were placed the children of Seth with the third light, Devathai. The souls of the saints are placed there. In the fourth realm were placed the souls of those ignorant of fullness, those who did not repent at once, but who, after some time, eventually repented. They are with the fourth light, Elalith. All these created beings glorify the invisible spirit. A crisis that became the world. It happened that the realm, Aeon, wisdom, Sophia, of conceptual thought, Epinoia, began to think for herself. She used the thinking, Ethemesis, and the foreknowledge, Prognosis, of the invisible spirit. She intended to reveal an image from herself to do so without the consent of the spirit, who did not approve without the thoughtful assistance of her masculine counterpart, who did not approve. Without the invisible spirit's consent, without the knowledge of her partner, she brought it into being. Because she had unconquerable power, her thought was not unproductive. Something imperfect came out of her, different in appearance from her because she had created it without her masculine counterpart. She gave rise to a misshapen being unlike herself. Sophia saw what her desire produced. It changed into the form of a dragon with a lion's head and eyes flashing lightning bolts. She cast him far from her, outside the realm of the immortal beings so they could not see him. She had created him in ignorance. Sophia surrounded him with a brilliant cloud, put a throne in the center part of the cloud so that no one would see it, except for the Holy Spirit called the Mother of the Living. She named him Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth is the chief ruler. He took great power, Dynamis, from his mother, left her, and moved away from his birthplace. He assumed command created realms for himself with a brilliant flame that continues to exist even now. The Fashioning of This World Ialdabaoth united with the thoughtlessness of Bonoya within him. He begot ruling authorities, exousia, modeling them on the incorruptible realms above. The first is Athoth, the second is Harmus, called the Eye of Flame. The third is Galilombri. The fourth is Yabel. The fifth is Adonayu, called Sabaoth. The sixth is Cain, called the Sun. The seventh is Ab- Abel. The eighth is Abrasin. The ninth is Yobel. The tenth is Armupiel. The eleventh is Melchior Adonain. The twelfth is Belias, who rules over the very depth of Hades. He made the first seven rulers to reign in the seven spheres of heaven. 
he made the next five rulers to reign in the five depths of the abyss. He shared a portion of his fire with them, but shared none of the power of light he had received from his mother. He is ignorant darkness. When the light mingled into the darkness, the darkness shone. When the darkness mixed with the light, the light diminished. No longer light, nor darkness, but dim. This dim ruler has three names. Yaldabaoth is the first, Saklas is the second, Samael is the third. He is blasphemous through his thoughtlessness. He said, I am God and there is no God but me, since he didn't know where his own power originated. His rulers created seven authorities for themselves. Each of these authorities created six demons apiece. There came to be 365 demons altogether. Here are the seven authorities, names, and physical forms. First, a thoth with a sheep's face. Second, Eloios with a donkey's face. Third, Astaphaios with a hyena's face. Fourth, Yao with the face of a seven-headed snake. Fifth, Sabaoth, who has the face of a dragon. Sixth, Adonin, whose face is that of a monkey. Seventh, Sabataios, with a face of flame and fire. These are the seven of the week. These authorities rule the world. Yaldabaoth has many faces, more than all that have been listed, so he can convey any face he wants to the seraphim around him. Yaldabaoth shared his fire with his seraphim, but gave them none of his pure light. Although he ruled them by virtue of the power and glory of the light had received from his mother, Therefore he called himself God and defied his place of origin. He united his thoughts, sevenfold powers, with the authorities who accompanied him. He spoke, and it happened. He named those sevenfold powers starting with the highest one, goodness paired with the first, Athoth, providence paired with the second, Eloios, divinity paired with the third, Astaphios, Lordship paired with the fourth, Yao. Kingdom paired with the fifth, Sabaoth. Zeal paired with the sixth, Adonin. Understanding paired with the seventh, Sabataios. Each has its own realm modeled on one of the higher realms. And each new name refers to a glory in the heavens so that Yaldabaoth's demon might be destroyed. The demon's own names given by Yaldabaoth are mighty names, but the power's names reflecting the glory above will bring about the demon's destruction and remove their power. That is why each has two names. Yaldabaoth modeled his creation on the pattern of the original realms above him so that it might be just like the indestructible realms. Not that he had ever seen the indestructible ones, rather the power in him deriving from his mother made him aware of the pattern of the cosmos above. When he gazed upon his creation surrounding him, he said to his host of demons, the ones who had come forth out of him, I am a jealous God and there is no God but me. But by doing this, he admitted to his demons that there is indeed another God. For if there were no other God, whom would he possibly be jealous of? His mother began to move back and forth because she had become aware that she now lacked light, for her brightness had dimmed. Since her consort had not approved of her actions, she grew darker. End of black font. Blue font now. I said, Master, what does it mean? She moved back and forth. He laughed, saying, It's not as Moses said, upon the waters, not at all. End of blue font. Black font resumes. When she saw the evil that had taken place and the theft of light that her son had committed, she repented. In the darkness of ignorance, she began to forget. She began to be ashamed. But she could not yet return above, yet she began to move. And so she moved back and forth. 
The arrogant one removed power from his mother, for he was ignorant. He thought no one existed except for his mother. He saw the host of demons he had created, and he elevated himself above them. But when the mother realized that that miscarriage was so imperfect, she came to realize that her consort had not approved. She repented and wept furiously. All of the divine realms, Pleroma, heard her repentant prayer. They sought blessing for her from the invisible virgin spirit. The spirit consented. He poured the Holy Spirit over her, brought forth from the whole full realm. Her consort did not come down to her on his own, but he came through the whole full realm to restore her to her original condition. She was elevated above her son, but she was not restored to her own original realm. She would remain in the ninth sphere until she was fully restored. Humanity begins. Then came a voice from the highest realm saying, The man exists and the son of man. Yaldabaoth, chief ruler, heard it. He thought it came from his mother. He did not know the true source of the voice. The Holy Mother, Father, perfect providence, image of the invisible, Father of everything, in whom everything has come to be. The first man, this is the one who appeared to them. He appeared in the form of a human being. All of the realm of the chief ruler quaked. The foundations of the abyss moved. He illuminated the waters above the world of matter. His image shone in those waters. All the demons and the first ruler together gazed up toward the underside of the newly shining waters. Through that light, they saw the image in the waters. Yadabaoth said to his subordinate demons, Let's create a man according to the image of God and our own likeness so that his image will illuminate us. Each one, through another's power, created aspects of the man. Each added a characteristic corresponding to the psychic factors they had seen in the image above them. They made a creature of substance in the likeness of that perfect first man, and they said, Let us call him Adam, so that his name will give us the power of light. Construction of the Human Body The seven powers began to work. Goodness made a psych of bone, providence made a psych of sinew, divinity made a psych of flesh, lordship made a psych of marrow, kingdom made a psych of blood, zeal made a psych of skin, understanding made a psyche of hair. The host of demons took these substances from the powers to create the limbs and the body itself. They put the parts together and coordinated them. End of Black Bond beginning of green font the first ones began by making the head abron created his head menegestroeth created the brain asterikmi the right eye daspamoka the left eye erenomus the right ear bisom the left ear akiram the nose benefrom the lips amen the front teeth ibikan the molars Basiliadim the tonsils, Akcha the uvula, Adaban the neck, Chaman the neck bones, Dirko the throat, Tabar the shoulder, Nyarkon the elbow, Abitrion the right arm, Evanthin the left arm, Chris the right hand, Beluai the left hand, Trenu the fingers of the right hand, Babel, the fingers of the left hand. Cremon, fingernails. Astrops, the right breast. Faroff, the left breast. Baum, the right shoulder joint. Ararim, the left shoulder joint. Areki, the belly. Thavi, the navel. Senafim, the abdomen. Arekthopi, the right ribs. Zabido, the left ribs. Baraius, the right hip. Thnuth, the left hip. Abulanarki, the marrow. Komenorin, the skeleton, Jisol, the stomach, Agramona, the heart, 
Baino the lungs, Sostropol the liver, Anisimalar the spleen, Thopithro the intestines, Biblo the kidneys, Roror the sinews, Tafreo the spine, Ipuspoboba the veins, Biniborin the arteries, Atomensefe respiration, Entholeia the flesh, Baduk the right buttock, Arabei the penis, Elo the testicles, Sorma the genitals, Gomrakokalabar the right thigh, Nebrith the left thigh, Serum the kidneys of the right leg, Asaklas the left kidney, Ormaoth the right leg, Emenum the left leg, Nix the right shin, Tupalon the left shin, Akil the right knee, Veni the left knee, Futhram the right foot, Bobel its toes, Thrakun the left foot, Fikna its toes, Miamai the toenails. And those who were appointed over all of these are Zathoth, Armas, Kalila, Ayabel, Zabaoth, Cain, Abel. The energizing powers in the limbs were divided among the head made by Diolimodraza, the neck by Yamix, the right shoulder Yakub, the left shoulder Verton, the right hand Odidi, the left Arbao, the fingers of the right hand Lapno, the fingers of the left hand Likafar, the right breast Barbar, the left breast Amai, the chest Pisandraptis, the right shoulder joint Kodi, the left shoulder joint Orior, the right ribs Ephixix, the left ribs Sunokuchta, the abdomen Aruf, the womb Sabalo, the right thigh Charcharb, the left thigh Thaun, the genitals Bathanoth, the right leg Chu, the left leg Charcha, the right shin Aror, the left shin Tutkta, the right knee Aol, the left knee Chariner, the right foot Bastin, its toes Archanthitha, the left foot Merapthnuns, its toes Abrana. Seven govern the whole body, Michael, Oriel, Asmenides, Saphasatoel, Armorium, Rikram, Amiorps. The one who governs perceptions, Archindicta, the one who governs reception, Ditherbathus, the one who governs imagination, Oma, the one who governs integration, Icariam, the one who governs impulse, Rairamacho. There is a fourfold source of the bodily demons, hot, cold, dry, wet. Matter is the mother of them all. Ruler of hot, Fluxofa, ruler of cold, Ororothos, ruler of dry, Aramako, ruler of wet, Athuro. Their mother stands among them, Onothokrasei. She is unlimited. She mixes with all of them. She is matter, and they are nourished by her. The four chief demons are Ephememphi, associated with pleasure, Yoko, associated with desire, Nenentofni, associated with distress, Blomen, associated with fear. Their mother is Esthesis Suk Epitoi. Out from these four demons come passions. From distress arises envy, jealousy, grief, vexation, discord, cruelty, worry, mourning. From pleasure comes much evil and unmerited pride and so forth. From desire comes anger, fury, bitterness, outrage, dissatisfaction, and so forth. From fear emerges horror, flattery, suffering, and shame. Their thought and truth is Anayo, the ruler of the material soul. It belongs with the seven senses, Esthesis Suk Epipoto. This is the total number of demons, 365. They work together to complete part by part the physical and the material body. There are even more of them in the charge of other passions that I didn't tell you about. If you want to know about them, you will find the information in the book of Zoroaster. End of the green font. Resumes with black font. 
All of Yaltabaoth's servant and his demons worked to finish the psychic body. For a very long time it lay inanimate, it did not move. Yaltabaoth's mother wanted to take back the power she had turned over to the chief ruler. She earnestly asked the most merciful, the mother-father of everything, for help. Yaltabaoth deceived. By his sacred command, he sent down the five lights in the forms of the principal advisors to Yaldabaoth. This led to the removal of Yaldabaoth's mother's divine power from him. They told Yaldabaoth, Blow some of your spirit in the man's face, then his body will rise up. Yaldabaoth blew some of his spirit into the man. The spirit was the divine power of his mother. He didn't understand what was happening, for he lived in ignorance. His mother's divine power left Yaldabaoth. It entered the psychic human body modeled on the primordial image. The human body moved. It grew powerful. It shone. Yaldabaoth's demonic forces envied the man. Through their united efforts, he had come into being. They had given their power to him. His understanding was far greater than that of those who had created him, and greater than that of the chief ruler himself. When they realized that he shone with light and could think better than they could and was naked of evil, they took him and cast him down into the lowest depths of the material world. The beginning of salvation. The Blessed One, the Mother Father, the Good Merciful One, looked compassionately upon the Mother's power relinquished by the Chief Ruler. Since Yaldabaoth's demons might again overpower the perceptible psychic body, he sent down from his good spirit a helper for Adam. Out of his great compassion, a light-filled Epinoia emerged, and he called her life Zoe. She aids the entire creation, working with him, restoring him to the fullness. She taught Adam about the way his people had descended. She taught Adam about the way he could ascend, which is the way he had descended. The light-filled Epinoia was hidden in Adam, so that the rulers wouldn't know about her, for Epinoia would repair the disaster their mother had caused. Adam was revealed because within him dwelt the shadow of light. His mental abilities were far greater than those of his creators. They had gazed upward and seen his exalted mental capability. The host of rulers and demons plotted together. They mixed fire and earth and water. Together with four blazing winds, they melted them together in great turbulence. Adam was brought into the shadow of death. They intended to make him anew, this time from earth, water, fire, wind, which are matter, darkness, desire, the artificial spirit. This all became a tomb, a new kind of body. Those thieves bound the man in it and chained him in forgetfulness, made him subject to dying. His was the first descent and the first separation, yet the life filled of Pinoya within him will elevate his thinking. Adam in Yaldabaoth's Paradise The rulers took the man and put him into paradise. They told him to eat freely. Their food is bitter, their beauty is corrupt, their food is deceit, their trees are ungodliness. Their fruit is poison. Their promise is death. They place the tree of their life into the middle of paradise. I will teach you, plural, the secret of their life, the plan that they made together about an artificial spirit. Its root is bitter. Its branches are dead. Its shadow is hatred. Its leaves are deception. The nectar of wickedness is in its blossoms. Its fruit is death. Its seed is desire. 
It flowers in the darkness. Those who eat from it are denizens of Hades. Darkness is their resting place. As for the tree called the knowledge of good and evil, it is the epinoia of the light. They commanded him not to eat from it, standing in front to conceal it, for fear that he might look upwards to the fullness and know the nakedness of his indecency. End of black font. Blue font. However, I caused them to eat. I asked the Savior, Lord, isn't it the serpent that caused Adam to eat? He smiled and replied, The serpent caused them to eat in order to produce the wickedness of the desire to reproduce that would make Adam helpful to him. End of blue font. Resume black font. The chief ruler, Yaldabaoth, knew that because the light filled the Benoia within Adam and made his mental abilities greater than his own, Adam had been disobedient. In order to recover the power that he had put into Adam, Yaldabaoth made Adam completely forgetful. End of black font. Resume blue font. I asked the Savior, What is it to be completely forgetful? He replied, It is not what Moses wrote in his first book. He caused Adam to fall into deep sleep. Rather, Adam's perceptions were veiled and he became unconscious. As he, Yaldabaoth, said through his prophet, I will make their minds dull so that they not see or understand. End of blue font. Resume again with black font. Woman comes into being. The light filled up in Oya, hid deep within Adam. The chief ruler tried to remove her from his ribcage, but Epinoia could not be captured. Although the darkness pursued her, it did not catch her. The chief ruler did remove a portion of his power from Adam to create a person with a woman's form modeled on the light-filled Epinoia that had been manifested to him. He placed the power removed from the man into the woman. End of black font. Proceeding with blue font. It did not happen the way Moses said it did. He took a rib and made the woman. End of blue font. Resuming again with black font. Adam saw the woman standing next to him. The light filled up Benoia immediately appeared to him. She raised up the veil that dulled his mind. He sobered up from the dark drunkenness and he recognized his own counterpart. He said, This is bone from my bones, flesh from my flesh. Because of this, a man will leave his mother and father and be joined to a woman, and those two will become one flesh, for they will send his helper to him. Sophia, our sister, came down, descending innocently so as to regain what she had lost. Therefore she was called Life, the mother of the living, the one from the providence of the authority of heaven, by her assistance, people can achieve perfect knowledge. I appeared as an eagle perched on the tree of knowledge, which is the epinoia from the pure providence of light, in order to teach them and raise them up from sleep steps. For the two of them were fallen and aware of their nakedness. Epinoia appeared as a being full of light. She enlightened their minds. When Yaldabaoth discovered that they had moved away from him, he cursed his earth. He located the woman as she was preparing herself for her man. He gave the woman over so that the man might be her master because he did not know the secret of the divine strategy. The man and woman were too terrified to renounce Yaldabaoth, who showed his ignorance to his angels, and he cast both of them out of paradise, dressing them in heavy darkness. The chief archon saw the young woman who was standing by Adam. He realized that the light-filled epinoia of life was within her. Yaldabaoth became completely ignorant. When the providence of all saw what was going to happen, she sent assistance to remove divine life from Eve. Yaldabaoth raped Eve. 
she bore two sons. Elohim was the name of the first, Yahweh was the name of the second. Elohim has a bear's face, Yahweh has a cat's face. One is righteous, one is not. Yahweh is righteous, Elohim is not. Yahweh would command fire and wind. Elohim would command water and earth. Yadabal deceptively named the two Cain and Abel. From then until now, sexual intercourse has persisted thanks to the chief ruler who put desire for reproduction into the woman who accompanies Adam. Through intercourse, the ruler caused new human bodies to be produced and he blew his artificial spirit into each of them. Yaldabaoth installed the two with authority over natural elements, so they can too rule over the tomb. The children of Seth populate the world. Adam had intercourse with the image of his foreknowledge prognosis. He begot a son like the son of man, and he called that son Seth, modeling him on the heavenly realm race in the higher realms. In the same way the mother sent down her spirit, the image of herself, a model of the full higher realm, in order to prepare a place for the descent of the realms. The chief ruler, though, forced the humans to drink from waters of forgetfulness, so that they may not know their true place of origin. The children of Seth remained in this condition for a while, in order that when the spirit descends from the holy realms, the spirit can raise up the children and heal them from all defects, and thus restore complete holiness to the fullness of God. End of Black Font We start now with Red Font. Six questions about the soul. I ask the Savior, Lord, will every soul be saved and enter the pure light? He replied, You are asking an important question. One, it will be impossible to answer for anyone who is not a member of the unmoved race. They are the people upon whom the spirit of life will descend and the power will enable them to be saved and to become perfect and worthy of greatness. They expunge evil from themselves and they will care nothing for wickedness, wanting only that which is not corrupt. They will achieve freedom from rage, envy, jealousy, desire, or craving. The physical body will negatively affect them. They wear it as they look forward to the time when they will meet up with those who will remove it. Those people deserve indestructible eternal life. They endure everything, bearing up under everything that happens so that they can deserve the good and inherit life eternal. Then I asked him, Lord, what about the souls who didn't do these things even though the spirit of life's power descended on them? He answered, If the spirit descends to people, they will be transformed and saved. The power descends on everyone, and without it, no one can even stand up. After they are born, if the spirit of life increases in them, power comes to them, and their souls are strengthened. Nothing then can leave them astray into wickedness. But if the artificial spirit comes into people, it leads them astray. Then I said, Lord, when souls come out of the flesh, where do they go? He replied, smiling, If the soul is strong, it has more of power than it has of the artificial spirit, and so it flees from wickedness. With the assistance of the incorruptible one, that soul is saved and it attains eternal rest. I then asked him, Lord, what of the souls of the people who do not know whose people they are? Where do they go? He responded, In those people the artificial spirit has grown strong and they have gone astray. Their souls are burdened, drawn to wickedness, and cast into forgetfulness. When they come forth from the body, such a soul is given over to the powers created by the rulers, bound in chains, and cast into prison again. Around and around it goes until it manages to become free from forgetfulness through knowledge, and so eventually 
it becomes perfect and is saved. Then I asked, Lord, how does the soul shrink down so as to be able to enter its mother or a man? He was happy that I asked this and said, You are truly blessed because you have understood. The soul should be guided by another within whom is the spirit of life. It will be saved by that means and accordingly will not have to enter a body again. And I said, Lord, what happens to the souls of the people who achieved true knowledge but who turned away from it? He said to me, Demons of poverty will take them to a place where there is no possibility of repentance. There they will stay until the time when those who blasphemed against the Spirit will be tortured and subjected to punishment forever. I asked, Lord, where did the artificial spirit come from? And he told me, that now is end of the red font and we pick up the black font. Three plots against humanity. The mother, father is merciful. A Holy Spirit sympathizing with us. Through the epinoia of the providence of the light, it raises up the children of the perfect race, raising up their thought, their light eternal. When the chief archon learned that they were elevated above him and that their mental ability surpassed his, he wanted to put a stop to their thought, but he did not know the extent of their mental superiority and he could not stop them. He made a plan with his demons, who are his powers, each of them fornicated with wisdom, Sophia, and produced fate, the last variety of imprisonment. Fate changes unpredictability. It is of different sorts, just as the demons are of different sorts. Fate is hard. Fate is stronger than the gods, the authorities, the demons, the generation of people who are caught up in it. Out of fate emerged sinfulness, violence, blasphemy, forgetfulness, ignorance, weighty commandments, heavy sins, terrible fear. In this way, all of creation became blind, ignorant of God above everything. Because of imprisonment in forgetfulness, they are unaware of their sins. They are bound into periods of time and seasons by fate, who is Lord of all. Yaldabaoth eventually came to regret everything he had created. He decided to bring a great flood upon creation, upon mankind. But the great light of providence warned Noah. He preached to all the children, the sons of men, but if they were strangers to him, they didn't listen. End of black font. We have blue font. It was not the way Moses said they hid in an ark. Rather, they hid in a special place, not just Noah, but also many other people from the immovable race. They went into hiding within a cloud of light. End of blue font. Resuming now with black font. Noah knew his own authority and that of the light being who illumined them, although the chief ruler poured darkness over all the world. The chief ruler and his powers plotted a strategy to send his demons to human daughters and to make themselves children by them to enjoy. But they failed. After their failure, they made another plan. They created an artificial spirit modeled on the spirit who descended so to impregnate souls by means of this spirit. The demons changed appearance to look like the woman's husband's. They filled the woman with that spirit of darkness and wickedness. They brought into being gold and silver, money and coins, iron and other metals and all things of this sort. And the people who were attracted were led astray into troubles and were greatly misled and grew old, experiencing no pleasure and died finding no truth never knowing the true God. This is the way that they enslaved all of creation from the foundation of the world until now. They took some women and produced children out of darkness and they closed their hearts and they hardened themselves in the hardness of their artificial spirit until the present day. 
and a black font. We're moving now to purple font, the Providence Hymn. I am the providence of everything. I became like my own human children. I existed from the first. I walked down every possible road. I am the wealth of the light. I am the remembering of the fullness. I walked into the place of greatest darkness and on down. I entered the central part of the prison. The foundations of chaos quaked. I hid because of their evil. They did not recognize me. I came down a second time, continuing on. I emerged from among those of light. I am the remembering of providence. I entered the middle of darkness, the inner part of the underworld, to pursue my mission. The foundations of chaos quaked, threatening to collapse upon all who were there and utterly destroy them. I soared upward again to my roots in light so as not to destroy them all yet. I descended a third time. I am light. I am dwelling in light. I am the remembering of providence. I entered the midst of darkness I came to the deepest part of the underworld. I let my face light up, thinking of the end of their time. I entered their prison. The body is that prison. I cried out, anyone who hears, rise up from your deep sleep. And the sleeping one awoke and wept, wiping bitter tears saying, who calls me? Where has my hope come from as I lie in the depths of this prison? I am the providence of pure light, I replied. I am the thought of the Virgin Spirit raising you up to an honored place. Rise up. Remember what you have heard. Trace back your roots to me, the merciful one. Guard against the poverty demons. Guard against the chaos demons guard against all who would bind you. Awaken, stay awake, rise out of the depths of the underworld. I raised him up. I sealed him with the light water of the five seals. Death had no power over him ever again. I ascend again to the perfect realm. I completed everything and you have heard it. End of purple font. We resume with blue font. Conclusion. I have told you everything now so that you can write it all down and share it with your fellow spirits secretly, for this is the mystery of the unmoved race. The Savior gave all of this to him to write and to keep carefully. He said to him, anyone who exchanges it for a present or for food or for drink or for clothing, or for anything else of that sort, will be cursed. And these things came to John in a mystery. Instantly, the Savior vanished. John came to his fellow disciples and told them what the Savior had said to him, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And this concludes the reading of The Secret Book of John.